Welcome to Nation. Oh, I got. I do have to say, real close to this thing. All right. Nation State supply chain attacks for dummies and you, or chipping Cisco firewall. So let's go. We got a lot of stuff to cover and not very long to do it in. Hi, I'm Monte, and I do cooking strippers. I mean, <laughs> for educational purposes only. I mean. I mean, I do the YouTube channel, Coke and Strippers. That's an educational channel. It's electronics. Anyway, you should you should go watch it. Okay. Uh, oh, and and you should you should note this. How many people? Yeah, we got people. Here. Take a good picture. Post something about this talk on Twitter and show it to me afterwards, and I'll and I'll give you something until they run out. I've got a little prize. A few of them. All right. So, super micro chipping news. Anybody remember this story from Bloomberg, Bloomberg last year? We got a few, right? Big article that maybe motherboards from super micro had small uh, implants on the motherboard that would allow remote ownership. And that's kind of scary because that kind of stuff is pretty much impossible to detect. It could be in, uh, you know, in your equipment. It may sub uh, survive a, a reboot or re-imaging uh, and it was introduced somewhere in the supply chain you don't necessarily get a chance to to see it to look at it um, there was a lot of of concern about it they said it might be in you know some of the big data centers maybe Apple or Google or, or whatever there, there were a few mentioned but nobody ever found any real evidence uh, so as far as I know it was not real still a little still a little now could y'all can y'all hear me art can you hear me Sort of, yes. Okay. If 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 you ever can't do this, <laughs> oh, you listen to the to the disc, to the thump music in the back. Okay, um, but we never found any real evidence of it. So, um, you know, still looking, still looking for proof. Instead of which, I decided that doesn't matter. Let's make it real. So, why not? That oh, and, and hopefully better than this. That's, that's you know, right? We start at that. Could be better. So, time to pick a device. I'm from the ICS space, uh, and my original thought was to pick maybe some of these, um, but I eventually decided on the Cisco firewall, which is also used there. The same attack back basically will apply to all of those, but the firewall has a little broader appeal, so, um, so we'll do it there. Try to consider what ways to do this. Um, after a little thought, I decided probably the serial port was the cheapest and the easiest and the fastest uh, to try to attack. Most of these devices are configured by serial port one way or the other. So, quick look at serial ports for your uh, to refresh your memory if you haven't played with one in a few days. <laughs> uh, simplest form, you need only three wires. You need a TX wire to talk to a device. You need an RX wire to receive information from the device, and you need a ground. Uh, they look like uh, they look like those connectors, or on the Cisco device, they're RJ45s. There we go. Now I can make little circles. Um, so here's a USB serial. They connect in those, and that port, that's the RJ45 serial connection, the way you would originally configure a Cisco firewall when you first get it. Who here has configured a Cisco firewall before? Oh, we got like a, half the audience at least, maybe more. Excellent. Serial signaling goes something like this. Um, you're going to pick a baud rate. There are various ones. Uh, 9600 may be the most common. You're going to pick a number of data bits, typically seven or eight, but like five is, is legal. Uh, you're going to have a parity. It can be none, odd, even, mark, space, um, and a number of stop bits. And that defines your, your serial packet, uh, how it's actually going to be transmitted on the physical wire. Very common is this 9600 8N1. That's our baud rate, number of data bits, parity none, and one stop bit. To uh, start dealing with the serial protocols, one of the things that I found very useful was this eight channel analyzer that you can get from all the usual places in China. Um, yeah, it's it kind of ironic. You use cheap Chinese stuff to try to hack cheap China. Never mind. Um, anyway, um, that and free software, uh, PulseView, freely available on the net, 
uh, on the net. It, there's, its companion is SIGROC uh, as well. So that I can see signals going in both directions, right? Normally, if you connect up to a serial port, you're just getting the receive channel. You won't necessarily see what's on the send channel unless the device on the other end reflects it to you. So I want to connect to both the send and receive, receive both channels simultaneously. I can set up pulse view to do that. All right, I'm setting up eight in one. Uh, a least significant bit first, right? That's what little Indian. Uh, I want to see it as ASCII. I need to invert the signal. So Pulse View, there's the link if you need it. It's great software. I don't have anything to do with the project other than I like it. In this case, what we see is these are the literal bits I am pulling off the wire. Uh, this is as I uh, use this UART decoder for them. I see a start bit, I see a bunch of data bits and a stop bit. If I interpret this as ASCII, which is what I've asked it to do, I end up here with the letter C, C-O-N-F-I-G and so forth. So that's a sample of this run. Typically you'll u run this uh, when you're doing serial, you'll use uh, a, a UART and a driver to uh, help you communicate with the hardware, and keep all of your, your, your voltages at the right level. These are the commonly seen voltage levels. We got 5 and 10 and 12 and 15. And that's a problem. On this device, it's swinging plus and minus 15, which will totally uh, destroy any type of microcontroller I want to try to connect to it. So we've got a little bit of a problem. But there's a trick. So. Uh, in doing some other work with, with attacking power supplies, I found this application note. And basically what it says is that these microcontrollers, at least the family I'm used to working with, the, the Atmel, and, and various other ones, have, um, have protection diodes built in on every input so that if the voltage swings above your positive voltage, above VCC, it gets tied there. And if the amount of current is low enough, right, that keeps that pin from going above your VCC voltage. Or it also keeps it from going below ground. But the but the key point to this is that it you have to limit the current, right? Otherwise you will just smoke those diodes and still blow the chip up. So what you need is just an appropriate sized resistor coming in. In this case, they're using one meg or one mega ohm and they can connect it to the AC outlet. Well, I only need to work for 15 volts, so uh, that should be something like a 15 kilo ohm resistor. Uh, turns out maybe 5.1K is close enough. Uh, I, that's why I started using the testing and it was working and I just never, I never changed back, right? It's, what, what's the number one rule in, in ICS, uh, you know, reliability? If it ain't broke, don't touch it. Yes, <laughs> it's working, don't touch it. You should, you should get a reward for that. No, I, well, we'll see you afterwards. No, no, hang on. Yeah, I don't have them. They're in my back. Um, so I want to be able to test this. Can I actually use this configuration to talk to um, the Cisco device? You know, this is a little big. I'm using this Arduino Mega. You know, what are they, 10, 15 bucks, maybe less if you, if you get them from, from the Chinas. Um, and uh, setting up a couple of resistors and this serial cable in. And sure enough, I find out Yes, I can talk to this device. Uh, I can receive these 15 volt signals without blowing it up. And also surprisingly, uh, just by sending it five volts and ground, I can transmit to it, which is, which is out of spec, right? The, the, the minimal spec is like negative three volts, but uh, for, for RS-232, well now TIA, but you know. Um, so, but it works. So, so far I'm in, right? I'm going down this path. How am I going to attack it? What hardware, software to use? Is this possible? It looks like I'm. It looks like I'm good. It looks like I'm. Uh, I'm prepared to to do this. It was a fairly quick and easy test, right? Get a piece of hardware, you plug it up. Not too hard. It works. The next thing is decide what actual kind of chip that I want to use in this. Part of the fun of the attack, I think is uh, using very small devices, right? If you remember the picture from the Bloomberg, it was a pretty small device. Uh, started out with this AT Tiny 10, which as I say here is not just tiny, it's minuscule. That, that's the one here in the tweezers. Um, 
and technically the the attack um, that that we'll see here in, in a little while uh, you could technically run it with that uh, microcontroller um, there's also the uh, AT Tiny 85. I chose that one because of some additional capabilities, in particular EEPROM. So that allows me to store information uh, in the chip. So like I could count number of reboots or, or, or maybe store some data if I could collect it. So uh, I chose the AT Tiny 85 for maybe some advanced features that actually at this point I haven't implemented. But it doesn't matter. There was also another advantage, and we'll, and we'll see, of choosing this AT Tiny 85. But technically, you could use the AT Tiny 10. Oh, there are a couple more advantages. One of them being uh, this carrier board, this DigiSpark. You can pick these up again from from where? China. Yeah, China, Taobao, Alibaba, Amazon, even. Five of them for $10. Um, the actual microcontrollers over here, this is a, a, a power supply chip. This, bind it in this format, just makes it quicker and easier. I can program it by shoving this straight in a USB port. Um, so uh, I, I get them, got them cheap. And, and that's my, I've got a few of these. So uh, take a picture, tweet me, and catch me afterwards and show it to me, and I'll give a few of them away. Um, that's your DigiSpark board. So I don't have to worry too much about programming it. And also, I can use existing tools. That saves me a little bit of time. I can use the uh, Arduino IDE interface. So now, this is my second round of test hardware that uh, I'm not using the, um, the uh, Mega anymore. I'm actually using this DigiSpark. Can I do this same thing with this other piece of hardware? There shouldn't be any reason why I couldn't. Um, but you know, you you want to you want to test it. It is a little more complicated to program. There's some limited amount of space and 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 some kind of uh, libraries to play with. But uh, connect it up, start running the tests, and um, at that point, find out that we are all good. Um, I can use this little device to. Uh, to communicate across the serial port. So now I'm getting closer, right? I've got a device, I've run the test. Um, I just need to be able to hide this on the motherboard somewhere. Oh, and I also mentioned that you can use the Arduino IDE to control this. There's the, uh, you really can't see it here. I assume this will be available somewhere online. Uh, links to all these parts and pieces are, are there. You, you're shaking your head, so it's gonna be online. Uh, and um, if you wanna follow along, Oh, by the way, though, for programming this board, usually in the Arduino world, you just hit program and it programs. For this board, you have to disconnect it and reconnect it. The bootloader will only allow it to program the first few seconds during power up. So I struggled with that for a few minutes the first time. Well, maybe more than a few minutes. The first time that I started fiddling with these. So uh, unplug the, hit, hit the program, unplug them, plug them back up. They program great. So now what do I do? So I've, I've picked the chip. It looks like it works. I've tested it. I can program it on this board. I don't want to install that whole board. That's ugly. That's big. It's obnoxious. So after I program it, I pull that chip off this board. Um, I use a little air rework, hot air rework. Now, it's just because I have it in, in my basement. All right, that's my below, my below ground layer. <laughs> in the basement. So, um, but you can use a soldering iron or whatever. But for, again, for all these things, like I don't get any money from who, who Banggood, which is actually a cool place to buy electronics online. Don't ask. Um, there's the links if you want them. But I pull the chip off of that board, right? Now I have my chip. It's all programmed. It's all ready to go. And so far, it's been relatively easy. I didn't have to, you know, uh, get any kind of special programmers or, or, or anything else, any small PC boards, because it, it came already connected for me. So one of the advantages of starting with these uh, DigiSparks, and it's cheap. So we talked about... Well, what ended up being four wires, that's RX and TX, transmit and receive. You also need power and ground. Um, but for this attack right now is I'm just running it blind. 
I'm just pushing uh, commands out. I'm not listening to anything coming back. So I can cut off one of those wires. I only need transmit and power and ground. So I end up with this little chip with three wires coming off of it. And at this point, I should be able to take that chip and solder it anywhere on this motherboard and send the commands that, that we'll run through here briefly. But these wires on a motherboard, sometimes called bodge wires, they look ugly, right? And they sort of indicate something weird's going on. I mean, occasionally you will see them for real, like the picture there on the left, uh, but they're, they're fairly rare. And what I really don't want is it to look like this picture on the right where somebody's, you know, just soldering all kinds of stuff, right? That's going to look really suspicious on your new equipment if it has all kinds of warts and stuff growing off of it. So I want it to look uh, better than that if possible. So what can I do about this three-wire installation? Well, I came up with a three-wire solution. It turns out that um, next to... Uh, uh, the port on this device that is the uh, RJ45 serial connection. There are also two USB ports. And this is the bottom of the motherboard uh, already, uh, the way it's already set up. This is factory original schmoo here. So, you know, <laughs> we'll talk about later looking for this thing. Uh, you might look for sort of strangeness on the motherboard. And this was already here from the factory. That wasn't even my doing. But what I found was at this location, here are uh, the pins for the RJ45 serial connection uh, and my TX line. And there's a ground. And then I pull power off of this. These are the USB ports. There are two USB ports, power ground, and I don't need the data connections. So I solder this small chip directly to the, to the motherboard uh, like this. Now I've got power and transmit, and it's awesome, right? I am in. Um, probably way too far late in this process. Wait a minute. Yeah. All right. So by the way, any, who here are like electrical engineers or electrical hobbyists? Well, we got, we need more electrical minded folks in this, in any case. So, <laughs> what is its value? What is the value of this thing? You don't have to be an electrical engineer to figure it out. Anybody? Five dollars. Five RMB. Half a cent. Half a penny, half a cent. No. Yes. Uh, now, I, I, I'm playing a little bit of word game here. But the value of it as a resistor is its resistance in ohms is? Zero. Zero. And it only costs like half a cent. But word games. Thank you for playing. Um, its value as a resistor value is zero. Why do we use a zero value resistor? What do we use that for? No, it's got zero protection value. Yeah, maybe, maybe, because it's small. Yeah, you might use it like a fuse. In this case, I'm just using it so I don't have to use a wire. Um, because I needed this one um, resistor, right, that's the one protecting me from the 15 volts, uh, I use this one to ground just so I don't have to put a wire in there. So uh, it turns out to be valuable. It makes this uh, a lot more invisible on this motherboard. And at this point, Success, right? I've got this thing on the motherboard. I've got it programmed. I've got it hidden. Golden. Except when I got to this point, which was really not too long ago, because I'd done all the tests. I knew it was fine. All I had to do was, was do this, and, and I'm ready for this presentation. Um, when I booted it up, it didn't work. My attack came too late in the boot process, and we'll see why that is in a minute. Uh, it turns out that this motherboard does not turn the power on to the USB port until after the thing is booted. Who knew, right? <laughs> well, when I'm poking around on the board, I'm looking for five volts and I plug it up, you know, five minutes later I find it. Who knew I had to wait for the boot cycle? So now it's like, it's the middle of the night, what am I gonna do? I've got, you know, I've got the perfect place for it. I guess worst case is I can pick another bodge wire and you know run it halfway across the motherboard and find five volts somewhere. But I found something else instead. I found this chip. This is the chip that controls the power to those USB ports. The computer sends it a signal um, 
and it takes five volts from this end line and it sends it out to the two ports, US, uh, out A and out B. Those are those two USB ports. So if I can manipulate this device, then I can have power there all the time. And uh, actually the easiest way to manipulate this device was actually this. Um, Anybody know what a solder bridge is? <laughs> All right. Generally, are they a good thing? <laughs> no, right? Generally, they're a mistake. You accidentally connected two pins together with a big glob of solder. It might be overlooked, maybe. But in this case, what it did was that it took the, the, the N5 volts and directly connected it to that serial port all the time. And also, that, that, this chip also will do like overcurrent protection, so you lose that. But, eh, you know. Who, who, who really cares? Not me. So I get to use a solder bridge as part of an attack. I just think that's cool. Uh, and no bodge wire to find five volts. So it's installed. You've seen it. You know what it looks like. Where is the chip on this motherboard? Yeah, okay. The pictures are kind of ugly. Um, it is there. All right, there it is, yay! Okay, um, you can find it. Look, I, I can take a high schooler and I can teach him to look for bad solder joints, all right, because this is hand soldered. It's not gonna look as good as machine soldering, but um, it can take a little while. So I put it on the motherboard, right? I'm gonna put it somewhere. In this case, it's on the bottom of the motherboard because that's where it fit better. Which means you have to take out 14 screws, pull off the front plate, pull off these little light pipes, take the motherboard out and turn it over to even be able to see it. So when you get a brand new piece of equipment designed to protect your network, who at first takes it all apart and lays it across their desk before they begin? Hey, <laughs> <Wait>, what? <laughs> um, all right, so your boss would probably give you funny looks if, if, if you take all of your equipment apart very first. Um, there's also another place to hide it, and this is my trade secret, so I'm just sharing it with you all. Um, this, is the, this is the RJ45 and the two USB ports in this metal can. If you flip this board over and unsolder these four points that holds this can on, in the back of this can, there's a hole about the same volume as in the front. I could stack up like 15 of those chips in there. So you can put it in there, solder this tin back on it. Now for somebody to find it, they have to take all the 14 screws out, they have to take the motherboard out, turn it upside down, they have to start desoldering all these cans. There are actually several of them around the motherboard if you look, uh, and seeing if, 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 if Monte's hitting something stupid in, in one of them. So not very likely. Um, I didn't do that for this because I thought it wasn't fair, right, if you couldn't somehow see it. This is my... <laughs> this, is, this is my, you know, emergency safety trick, solve all the problems. I found these really nice uh, warranty void for mood stickers. They have holograms. They are individually serial numbered. They have a barcode. They even say, if you look carefully, it says, it says genuine, authentic in the hologram. <laughs> right? So you slept that on the outside of the box, you've already eliminated 80% of the population right there. Who takes a new piece of equipment, the first thing you do is cut the warranty void. If we, yeah, no. all right, that's my backup plan. All right, so we are going to uh, look at the video of the demo normally. Normally I plug these up, but we're on a kind of short time frame. It's actually built in the bottom of this motherboard. Here is my uh, test rig, by the way, in uh, TSA-friendly Tupperware so that I can travel with it. But instead, let's go through a, uh, a video. All right, so I will... Describe this as we go along. This top window is just uh, capturing the data uh, as it would look to the Cisco device. I'm not typing or, or anything. This is all anything that happens up here is the result of the Cisco device and this embedded chip that we've put in so far. You notice that there's a little timer that says, and that's just me highlighting it, um, a timer that says you can press escape to go into ROM mode. 
right? So it presses escape, and then it does this uh, config register OX41. This is what allows you to modify an existing piece of hardware. I got this off eBay with a full config installed. We'll talk about that offline. Um, uh, it allows me to boot it without knowing the password. So now the implanted device, after it does that and it boots, uh, I may not know what the, ex it's booting blank, but I got in without a password. I don't know what their existing network is like, really, or what the existing network configuration is. So the first thing that it does is it loads up the existing config uh, that's stored on this device. And uh, we'll see that come up in a second. And then we're going to take that existing config and modify it, adding a SSH port, opening up a connection to the outside interface, which is probably connected to the internet, along with credentials that are only known to us. Right? That's nice. And this down here in the bottom is just a testing script I have running. I'm trying to ping this firewall. We see it's not responding yet because it's not booted. Um, it's going to the config. It's generating the, right? If we're going to control this device remotely, we're going to do it securely, right? SSH all the way <laughs> for the win. Uh, and so forth. So uh, you can follow along there for a second. One other little piece of magic tip is that um, you cannot see this happen if you plug into the console port. If you plug into the console port, it overrides, the voltage overrides that small resistor and it doesn't happen. So imagine you get this box, you plug it up, uh, you configure it, it's all great. You will never see this happen. You unplug it, you put it in the rack, and then when you power it up, you're owned. Now, assuming you go back around and scan the machine and see there's something wrong with it, what do you do? Well, you try it two or three times. It keeps getting owned every time you reboot it. You pull it out. You put it on your desk. You connect the serial cable up to it. You're like, oh, this is, you, you reconfigure it. It's great, right? You put it back in the rack. You reboot it, all right? So if you test your configs every month, right, I get an average of 15 days to screw with it. And you're going to pull it out at least once and put it back. So I'll get two times 15 days. All right, in the bottom, uh, we got the ping back, um, and we, oh, let me get back up just a little bit. Um, we saw that the SSH port was open. We connected with our uh, credentials only known to us, and now we have enabled, which is admin level access, and just printed out uh, part of the config of this device. So that, that's the uh, play demonstration. Uh, at some point, maybe we can do it uh, live for real. Um, that's pretty much it. I've got... So Cisco defines this attack as password recovery. There's a document there that basically describes how you do this sort of, at, sort of adding the accounts. Uh, we could um, make this more sophisticated, but not really. I used to call these attacks the Miyagi style attacks. You, you remember the movie? He says, right, the crates like, if do right, no can defend. All right, so but you, you can't see it in the firmware. You can't detect it. It happens on its own. You can reflash it. It doesn't work. That's not quite true. If you pull your brand new equipment apart and look very carefully, look for rework, look for bad solder joints, um, and regularly baseline your equipment, look to see if it's changed, in map it, check the configs and so forth, that's your opportunity. All right, um, that's it. What I learned is this really isn't very hard. I did this in my basement. Uh, you know, I'm okay, but I'm not that good at it. You could get this and follow along if you've done any hobbyist work. I think really though, it's a pain in the butt to do. And nobody's going to do that. This is currently only for targeted attacks. Why only targeted attacks? Because your security sucks, right? Cisco's had lots of vulnerabilities in their firmware, and you don't even have to you don't even have to modify it to get there. So I'm Monte Elkins. Catch up with me on Twitter. Uh, don't forget to do Coke and Strippers. I mean the YouTube channel. Uh, and we'll see you next time, Defcon. Thank you very much.